Classic is is just a term. Uh, I mean, it, it's been used for for thousands and thousands of years. Um, they tended to be originally poems, um, so really long form poems. That that um, we'll explore a couple of them. There's a lot of genres uh, now, as you can expect. Uh, there's a lot of different types of epics, religious epics, uh, um, kind of uh, more. European epics or, or um, Middle Eastern or Indian epics, all of these are, are cut, cutting across with a lot of different rules. Um, ancient Greek as well, which is one that we'll touch on, and acro uh, coming across a lot of different cultures. So some of the oldest epics, as you can expect, come from some of the oldest civilizations. Um, so uh, out of India and Hinduism, the two kind of oldest, longest epics uh, known to, to man, really, are the Mahabharata, uh, Ramayana. These are, are some really long epic poems about um, something that we'll get into a little bit on the next slide. You have, again, obviously the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer, something that a lot of people might be familiar, familiar with. Um, again, these long epics that, that speak about culture, speak about different times, different journeys, different adventures. Beowulf, a bit more of a, a, a recent one. We're talking maybe... Um, 900 uh, AD, so in, in old English coming about. And then obviously some, some more modern epics that we, you might be familiar with, things like Moby Dick and Lord of the Rings. Obviously, again here, Lord of the Rings is more of a fantasy epic. Moby Dick is just an epic rather than any specific genre. It's a, it's a journey of an individual. Jumping into the Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana, so these were some of the oldest uh, um, epics of, of all time, again, uh, written in Sanskrit, they are some of the longest poems ever written. So uh, just I wanted to get the number right. Uh, the Mahabharata is one of the longest poems ever written, and it's, uh, has, its longest version contains 100,000 score or over 200,000 verse lines, and it has about 1.8 million words. So it's roughly 10 times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, or about four times the length of the Ramayana. So you can see how epic just even the, the amount of words, uh, the amount of uh, lines in it is, is a huge scale. You know, these are, 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 are epics that take years and years and decades and, and, and centuries potentially probably to write and covering a wide range of topics and ultimately really speaking about what it means to be a good person, a good human. I mean, the Mahabharata and Ramayana, as you can see and as you can expect and um, as you can uh, imagine, has a lot of religious uh, connotations to it. It's, it's discussing an entire religion. And this is only, again, one part. The Iliad and the Odyssey, um, again, probably one that you're a lot more familiar with, um, uh, especially from, from a Western view. But again, looking at these ancient Greek Epics. The Odyssey is that very classic story of a man that leaves his home country on a journey to come back, to only come back home, knowing more about himself. So that structure, what we know as, as a story, uh, as, a, as a modern story, all comes back to these old epics uh, from ancient Greece. And you have Beowulf, again, one of the ones written in Old English. I mean, this is Old English here uh, on the image that you can see. Uh, but you know, again, a, a long epic that, that touches on a lot of important topics of what it means to be a nobleman, a gentleman, a good person, but obviously, again, within these uh, different elements. And obviously, as, as we know, Moby Dick, that, that um, story, you know, I mean, the white whale now is, is a metaphor that's used in so many ways, but following, again, in those traditions that we've seen from Beowulf, from Iliad, from Odyssey, and you can tell a lot of these, I mean, I'm focusing on Western, Eastern cultures at this stage. And we're going to have, uh, a, you know, the next section after this one is going to be much more focused on the Middle Eastern. So we, we discussed a little bit on an epic without specifically going into a sci-fi epic. So the, the, the second part of that question then starts to come out is how do you write a sci-fi epic? So the key thing, uh, as you can expect, for you to write a sci-fi epic, or at least for certain uh, people is that there needs to be science. Now, again, what is science, what is not? I mean, a lot of modern uh, 
considerations, a lot of modern thinking, is that science fiction doesn't start until about the end of the 18th century, give or take, when the scientific revolution really starts bringing science into the forefront. Obviously, again, a lot of years before that, but without science, there's no science fiction. You have a lot of famous authors, again, focusing here on, on Western, on, on English-speaking uh, authors, with H.G. Wells, Philip K. Dick, Margaret Atwood, Jules Verne, Mary Shelley, and George Orwell. I mean, these are some that I'm going to quickly touch on some of their work, why they were important. Again, obviously, a lot of other science fiction writers that, that I haven't mentioned, and this is not a, a, an exhaustive list at all, but just to give you an idea of how science fiction was taken in so many different ways and it was built on. So obviously with H.G. Wells, again, things like The Time Machine, War of the Worlds, exploring these uh, topics based on his, his own kind of interpretation, his own uh, scientific knowledge and, and kind of extrapolating to it. So The Time Machine is one where an individual is jumping through kind of different parallel worlds, meeting different societies, each one representing obviously a way our societies. And, and if anything, with really, really good science fiction, they end up being timeless because it's just a reflection of us. And we'll start seeing it on the Middle Eastern ones as well, is that they've still kept their relevance. Um, I just want to check if anything is coming through. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So with H.G. Wells, kind of one that's a, a little bit more contemporary, if you will, um, is Philip K. Dick. I mean, again, H.G. Wells, if he's considered the grandfather of science fiction, Philip K. Dick is, is kind of almost the, the prince uh, or, or the, the father of science fiction. His, his mind, what he looked at, what he, what he wrote, I mean, touched on so many different parts of what it, what it means to be a human and really exploring it through a lot of these different uh, concepts, different ideas. So, you know, a lot of his books have, have been turned into movies. I, I think his writing... Has a, has a very visual appeal to it. So that's why we've probably seen a lot of his work. But Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is probably better known as Blade Runner. Um, Minority Report, obviously, The Man in the High Castle, uh, more of an alternate history, a science fiction. But, you know, a lot of Philip K. Dick, K. Dick's books were made into movies. And they, they although they're written in, in, you know, in the 60s, they still speak to so much of what it means to be human by exploring these. Uh, and Mazen, Margaret, would you say, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. uh, would you say that <clears throat> there's something like, uh, is it necessarily related to some future universe or is it just a sort of meditation on science more broadly for it to be science fiction? A really good point. I mean, again, the thing I guess the, with <clears throat> science fiction as it's developed is that there's been sub, 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 sub genres. So you obviously have ones that have a lot more of a future focus. So, you know, with H.G. Wells and Philip K. Dick, there was a natural future focus to them. Um, but as we, as we see here with Margaret Atwood, that was less so. I mean, Margaret Atwood's hand tales is set in the very near future. And she even um, reportedly said that nothing in The Handmaid's Tale isn't happening somewhere in the world. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, obviously a future sense to it is, is a part of it, is a key part, and probably at the start of science fiction there was. But, you know, moving with Jules Verne, obviously he was very famous in his future look. Um, and I mean, from the Earth to the Moon, it was written in the 1800s. He uh, had a lot of, uh, he even kind of estimated the amount of uh, kind of the speed that's needed to, to, to depart from the atmosphere. And he was incredibly close to it. But I guess, again, showing the strength of science fiction and how it can be taken. But he was obviously, again, a component of that future. But Mary Shelley, obviously, with Frankenstein, it's not set in the future. It's set in, in Gothic Germany uh, in the 1800s. So, you know, there's elements that science fiction can add. Um, and a future is, is a key one. And, and probably future is one that people come back to. It's just because in a, in a future time, you can imagine anything. You don't need to reimagine something existed. You just say it's set a thousand years in the future. Everything is different now. So, you know, but with Mary Shelley, it, it can, it's a lot of, um, you know, modern critics say that Frankenstein can be 
one of the, can be considered one of the main science fictions because of all the kind of elements within it about re resurrecting a human body, using electricity, taking different human parts. Um, and I mean, one of the best quotes that uh, I, I really wanted to know on, uh, on Frankenstein, it's one by uh, Guillermo del Toro, where he said, you know, for, uh, Frankenstein, it's the quintessential teenage book. You know, it was speaking about the, what it means to be a teenager. You don't belong. You're brought to this world by people that don't care for you, and you're thrown into a world of pain, hunger, suffering, and tears. It's an amazing book written by a teenage girl. She was 18 when she started, finished at, at 20, and it's, it's mind-blowing. So again, but it's still exploring a lot of the themes that we tend to see. And then again, uh, in, the, in the 40s as well, we started seeing more, especially in kind of response to uh, the war. And, and, you know, as it is with all fiction, so Phil K. Dick really going on that counterculture, Mar Margaret Atwood a bit more on the kind of conservative that we started, conservatism that we started seeing more in the 80s. But George Orwell in the 40s, following uh, kind of all the totalitarian states that were coming into, space, in, into, into place, things like uh, Russia and these type of places and obviously Nazi Germany. So 1984, a very, very famous science fiction uh, book ethic to, to really consider. Uh, again, building on what was happening at the time and just extrapolating it and taking it to that, to that next part. So, you know, with, with these just quick, uh, these quick um, kind of uh, snippets from the different Western authors, I then wanted to dive into, well, what does it mean to write a Middle Eastern sci-fi epic but a long time ago? I'm going to move a little bit faster, obviously, again, conscious a little bit of the time. But one of the, the main, if you want, epics with a lot of science fiction um, elements to it is the Epic of Gilgamesh. So this is a, a Babylonian uh, uh, piece, if I'm not mistaken. And it's about Gilgamesh, who was the king of Uruk um, and Akindi, so modern day Iraq, um, who befriends this wild man, Akindi, uh, that's created by the gods to stop him. So again, it's these two forces that come into play to try to stop each other. And obviously they end up becoming friends and they go on these journeys together Akindu dies, and then Gilgamesh decides he wants to go and find the, the, the kind of uh, immortality, if you want, or to find the, the fountain of youth. Um, and then, I mean, this is one of the quotes from the book, and, and really, really good science fiction. And again, this one, I'm sure it could be debated, but to a certain degree has those science fiction elements, always speaks to what it means to be a human. So from, from this epic, uh, life which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life was held in their own hands. So again, speaking to mortality, to what it means to just be a human. And probably one we're all a little bit more familiar with is A Thousand and One Nights. So obviously the structure in A Thousand and One Nights is, is a really, really good framing device that was used to, to write a lot of different Tales, a lot of different stories. Um, and a lot of them had a lot of fantasy and science fiction elements, again. So you might be familiar with, you know, the 40 uh, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, Aladdin, all of these um, really famous A Thousand and One Nights. But there were four that I, I kind of picked out that had a lot of these fantasy and science fiction elements. So the first one's The Adventure of Burkia. So this one, just to, yeah. So this one has a, a protagonist that, again, similar to Gilgamesh, is looking for that herb that gives you immortality. And they end up going on this uh, adventure across the seas where they go to heaven, they go to hell, they cross into space, they go into different worlds, big worlds. And again, a lot of those galactic science fiction, so meeting alien races, meeting sorcerers, mermaids, serpents, so a lot of these uh, out of this world um, experiences, if you will. Another one which I thought was, again, very, very interesting, and you can see those Western elements coming later, um, Abdullah the Fisherman and Abdullah the Merman. So it's about a man that gains the powers to breathe on the water. He gets gills. He goes underwater, and he encounters a society that's an exact reflection of the, of the, of the, of the society up on the ground. And that's where there's a sort of communism 
um, where there's no concept of money closing and it's just people kind of trying to, to live. And that, again, that type of, of, of situation where it's meeting other fantastical societies that gives it that science fiction feel. And, a, and another really, really interesting one with a lot of, again, science fiction elements, more than even the Adventures of Lucia and Abdullah the Fisherman, is the city of Brass. So this one is, is, a, is a story, uh, a, one of those great A Thousand and One Night stories that um, where a group of, of travelers go on this archaeology, archaeological expedition across the Sahara and they find this ancient city and they recover a brass vessel um, that then allows them to basically go on this uh, even greater journey where they see what at the time were humanoids. So in the way that it's described, almost sounds like robots um, or what, what was called or kind of translated into English as automata. So kind of automatic human. So again, you can see these science fiction elements even back then that are describing robots and how these uh, robots uh, and, and horse robots also come into play, which actually leads to the ebony horse, which again is this horse robot or, or this kind of flying horse robot that's able to go anywhere within a day. So again, that very science, science fiction element to it that really uh, speaks to, again, the human spirit, but has a lot of those elements that are a lot more common that we see now within science fiction. And a, and a very, very interesting one, which is around, uh, which was written in the 1200s by Zakaria al Khwazmi, which is Awaj bin Afaq. So again, this is one of those that are considered the first of the science fiction work. Here, proto meaning that there's elements of it, and, you know, I'm sure there's endless debates about what is the first science fiction or what is the one that has the first element. This one, again, is that story of an alien that comes to Earth that tries to understand what it, what it is, to, what are these sophisticated creatures and what are they about. And it has a lot of influence, again, as you can expect from that time from, uh, you know, mystic Ibn al-Arabi, but also obviously about Islam. And it's part of a larger series that uh, Al Khawazni wrote, which is Ajaib Al Makhluqat or Gharaib Al Mawjudat. So, looking at you know, the, the wonders and mysteries of creatures and the, the strangeness of creation. And another, uh, I mean, uh, this is the last one of kind of the older ones that, are, that I wanted to touch on, which is the treatise of Kamil on the Prophet's biography. So, this is one that was written by um, Ibn al-Nafis. So it's, it's one that uh, someone, uh, kind of a, one of those very, uh, at the time, Islamic scholars that writes and does, uh, you know, math and science and art and the, the, the kind of the, those individuals that just seem to be, you know, the, the Renaissance men as, as they were called then in the Renaissance, but they always were. And this book was written again in sometime in the 12th, uh, in the 13th century, a lot of people consider it to be one of the first Arabic novels, but has, again, those elements that we might know from a science fiction. So it's a coming-of-age story, has a desert island aspect to it, so it's an individual that gets cast away um, that um, basically is in this cave that gets created, and then they start going on this journey to try to understand more about themselves. And towards the end, the novel becomes a lot more science fiction where it's the end of days, there's resurrection, a lot of those elements of, of kind of intergalactic explosions and, and things just going uh, haywire to a certain degree. At the time, I mean, Ibn Nafis wrote it as a bit of a defense of the system of Islam um, to say that, you know, there, there has, there's this requirement for there to be a, a religion or a way to understand the world or else it makes it more difficult to live. One of the just very kind of side uh, um, things that was put together in this book, and a lot of scholars agree that this is sort of the first real uh, description of metabolism uh, was, is within this book. So you have that um, quote on, on, the, on the slide. So both the body and its parts are in continuous state of disillusion and nourishment. So they're inevitably undergoing permanent change. 
So one of the things that we tend to see with science fiction, like we've seen with the Western one, is this, um, by taking these kind of concepts that are available now, when they get extrapolated, start to really touch on things that end up either being true or end up happening. So a lot of the Philip K. Dick books um, touch on a lot of different technologies, which more and more we've seen. So kind of ways to speak through a video phone, uh, where at the time maybe they were just only phones. Um, so uh, a, a lot of these type of the science fiction end up becoming reality. And sometimes it's a mix of both. Sometimes it's reality following science fiction. So someone's a, a fan of a, a, of a work and decides that they want to make this a reality. But sometimes it's, it's, it's just um, something that gets described, which later on gets proven to be correct. Jumping a little bit more into time. Sorry, Mikey, was there a question? Yeah, just a really quick question. The, the, the works that you've discussed up until this point, were these things you were aware of before diving into the topic? Or these are books that you've sort of, through your research, categorized yourself as like science fiction epics or Middle Eastern science fiction epics? Or were there ones that are like largely categorized that way and you just kind of stumbled upon them? Uh, I would say the latter, so largely categorized as science fiction, uh, Middle Eastern science fiction epics. Again, some of them are, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the debates about what is science fiction and what is it, wasn't something I didn't, wanna, I didn't want to get too deep into in this talk, uh, especially when you're looking at the older ones. In the more modern ones, you're going to see very clear distinction that these are science fiction, but the older ones, it's more about elements. Again, because it's a consideration to say, can you have science fiction without, uh, can you have science fiction without science? And, you know, at the time there was a form of science, you know, there was a lot of um, things that were being explored, but science as we know it now, uh, kind of all the elements that it, that it takes for something to be considered, you know, as part of that scientific uh, theory, hadn't really, Come about, you know. So it's definitely more about exploring the topic, finding out, and then seeing these ones that are a lot of different um, elements. I mean, Awaj bin Afaq, unfortunately, there wasn't that much that I could find on, but the way that it was described and that people had that had read it meant discussed it meant or or showed that there was a lot of scientific elements. To it, cool. You know? Thanks. Obviously, again, the Epic of Gilgamesh, same thing, where it's. It's fantastical, which makes it epic. And then there's always these elements that look like science fiction, you know, and same thing with A Thousand and One. I mean, A Thousand and One Nights was definitely one that I was familiar with, but I was, I was really, really impressed about um, how much it spoke to science fiction in the way that we know it. And I, I, I see here Mohammed uh, Shabani wrote, the old Twilight Zone is a phenomenal example of sci-fi sci -sci plotting. The One Thousand and One Nights, is exactly like that. When you read some of these stories, it's so tightly written and so exciting about what happens and you kind of want to know what happens next and constantly reflecting back to what it is to be a human, which is what all the really great Twilight Zone um, episodes are about. And actually going on to some of the more modern Arabic, um, Hamad, you're going to be probably surprised about some of the elements that some of these authors wrote. Um, should I answer some of the questions as I'm going or shall I leave them to the end? It's up to you totally. I would, uh, yeah. if you want to get through it at the end, you can. Um, it's up to you though. Rami. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, I mean, I'm, I'm making a list of all the questions just so that we don't miss any. So it's really up to you. If you want to pick some of them up now, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll wait until the end. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll definitely come back to some of these. Okay, um, so when looking at some of the more modern science fiction, I ended up really seeing that Egypt at the time, and here we're talking about the 60s, 70s, was the leader of science fiction. And I mean, obviously, writing in general at the time, Egypt was ahead of most of the other Arab countries. So naturally, science fiction came about. Um, but these four were ones that I wanted to focus on. So Yusuf Azuddin Isa, the guy in the top right of the tie, I have to say, you know, uh, for authors, they're very well dressed. I think we tend to imagine science fiction writers to be slightly hippie, long hair, you know, um, but at, 
obviously for them, they were, they were well-respected writers uh, in their own right. Uh, you know, science fiction wasn't really looked down upon or, or considered to be kind of pulp or for young people. Um, so the four that I wanted to focus on in terms of New Egypt, Yusuf Azuddin Isa, Mustafa Mahmoud, and Tawfiq Hakim, as well as obviously Najib Mahfouz. So Yusuf Azuddin, um, when we look at kind of the authors at the time, uh, he was a really prolific writer, and he wrote a lot of dramas, actually. So The Wheels of Day uh, at the time was one that got broadcast in 1940. Um, and it had, again, those elements of science fiction. So here in the 40s, sorry, not the 60s. So starting in the 40s and moving into the 60s. But it had these science fiction elements. And it was about um, kind of the, the temporal state of being. So as a concept, again, uh, I, I'm, I'm leaning back to Hamad's uh, Hamad note on Twilight Zone, but really good science fiction, it's when you describe it, your mind starts to automatically imagine scenarios, and these writers all did that. So for Wheels of the Day, the, the idea was that um, it's a scenario where the sun is no longer going west, it's starting to go east, and now basically the past is the future. So there's no more future. And everything that you've known is now what's going to happen. So it, it talks about that kind of society when something like that's changed. So again, that, just that concept I, I, and, you know, describing it now, I'm sure you can start to imagine how interesting that would be to yourself, to us as a society, if that suddenly started to happen. So again, really touching on that topic of time, um, something that no one can, can really deviate from. Um, and then another one that as well that um, probably speaks to our time a lot more. And again, um, I don't want to continuously reiterate that, but really good science fiction will always have that element that then you look back and say, oh, wow, um, that speaks to this time right now. And it was a, a drama, a radio drama that he wrote called The World of Donkeys, where basically it's a dystopian future where now donkeys are in charge um, because basically of how dumb humans have gotten. So donkeys have become smarter, and now they're the kind of political elite. They're the ones that are running uh, society. So again, you can see these kind of elements uh, as well. And then facade, which is um, al-wajiha, uh, it's just one where it's a world that's incredibly clean and everything's perfect, um, but there's no kind of soul to it that he then, he then touches on. Jumping to Mustafa Mahmoud. So, Mustafa Mahmoud, uh, Mustafa Mahmoud is a very, very interesting writer because he himself was a philosopher, uh, but also a, a, a noted uh, religious scholar. So talked a lot about religion, but again, just by nature of science fiction, it can speak to, to you and your thoughts, and you can put them in a way that makes it a lot more interesting. So he wrote a number of, of uh, science fiction novels, and here were two that I, that I found, so Al-Ankabut, or The Spider, and Rajal the man with the temperature below zero. Um, he wrote on, on, on a lot of these books, and a lot of them were, again, touching on those elements. So uh, in terms of uh, Alain Kabul, it's, it's trying to kind of explore and find out a completely different society that has a lot of different elements to it. Um, you, unfortunately, quite a few of these, it's hard to get as much information as you'd like about them. Interestingly enough, some of the older ones, like A Thousand and One Nights, all of those are in public access. You can go and read every single A Thousand and One Nights uh, right now. But some of the more newer ones, they're either out of print or there's a review or a review of it, um, which again, maybe is, is an unfortunate thing. And I think going forward, it's something that's, that's likely to, to, to take place less and less, as you can expect. Um, I just want to see if there's any... Okay. Um, and then going on to Tawfi uh, Hakim. So he was one that always uh, had a focus on, uh, always had a focus on science fiction. So I'll, I'll go through the last two very quick and then we'll, we'll jump into the to modern day and then we can go right into the, to the question. So he always had that science fiction element to him. So, I mean, he, so one of the books that he wrote was uh, Rihla ila al-Qamar, so Journey to the Moon. Another one was 
in the year 1 million where he imagined a world where there was no more disease, no more death, all of that was done. There was not even genders anymore. Everyone was just one gender uh, because all procreation was happening in lab. There was, the soap, uh, there was a kind of eternal life, but again, no love, no art, no poetry, no poetry. So speaking to, you know, societies that are always trying to aim for perfection, that want to be perfect, that, um, you know, end up becoming dystopian in this, in this approach to become perfect societies, but then they, they lose all, all sense of what it means to be a human. At the end of this talk, obviously, uh, you, you can see all the other references, so you can explore them a little bit more. Uh, unfortunately, won't be able to go into as much detail um, as I'd want. And then lastly, in terms of uh, Najib Mahfouz, so one of the more famous ones, very similar to a certain degree to Time Machine, Al-Hirat ibn Fatuma. So it's about a man that journeys to all these different lands that have different societies, um, some brute, some kind, some you know, docile, and each time he's uh, either getting in prison because he passes information that's not accepted, or he, in one of the societies, he ends up staying there for 30 years, gets a wife, has children, and then ends up getting in prison because a war society comes in and takes him over, and it's this very kind of dark, neo-noir, almost, well, neo kind of uh, world uh, approach to these, to these societies. And then jumping on to the last part, how do you write a science, Middle Eastern science fiction epic today? So the good thing, as I'm sure you've seen, um, a lot of science fiction is, is giving voice to people that don't, don't, don't tend to get voices. So a lot of the old Arabic science fiction, and as it is with, with Western science fiction, um, was mainly male, uh, you know, mainly the main kind of... Uh, intellectual, if you want, or upper middle class societies that are writing. But obviously, as you can expect, as time goes on, it becomes more and more open. And now you have a lot more open, a lot more different voices coming into being. And these are, again, just a few collections of them. So Iraq Plus 100 is a really interesting set of books about imagining Iraq 2103, so 100 years after the U.S. invasion into Iraq. So you can see, again, that escapism that, um, uh, that science fiction can give. A bunch of other ones as well, Alif the Unseen, a really, really interesting book that, that I read, which is about kind of this young hacker, Alif, who it's, it sounds almost like Dubai in the book, and he's living in Dera and then kind of the, the lower part, if you want, or, or the poor part of Dubai, and he's a hacker and trying to figure out these algorithms. A really, really good book. And what all of these have is really giving a Middle Eastern point of view. So that the beauty of all of that, again, is that you can write it no matter what it is you think or feel or who you are or what you are or who you want to be. Science fiction allows you to write that. And all of these and all really strong science fiction has these details, these really, really interesting parts of the society that you can explore and go into. And as you know, a lot of really good science fiction leads to fan fiction as well and really strong ones like Lord of the Rings or, or Star Wars, all of these people take that on because they feel it, because it speaks to them. It's a world that they um, feel strongly for. And ultimately, with, with a really, really good science fiction, it's, it's trying to answer that question of the what if. So here, sorry, I'm trying to give an idea of what it takes to actually write it. So answering that question, how do you write it? So answering the what if. Um, each of these is asking, a very interesting what if. So the Q was one actually that Mikey turned me on to. It's a really interesting what if. What if there's a society set in the future and any time you needed to go do something, there was one single Q you needed to go wait in line for. And everyone is monitored. Anyone that needs any type of support from the government needs to stand in this queue. So again, that really interesting what if. And ultimately, you know, not being afraid of the new. As you can imagine with all of these, they speak to political situations in a, a lot more of a veiled uh, approach. And unfortunately, a lot of science fiction writers have, in more recent times, especially post-Arab Spring, been arrested, been jailed, because it may be cut too close to home. I mean, the queue is, is one that maybe speaks to 
Egyptian society, a lot of Egyptians might be might speak to it, but probably when I when I was reading through it, it was one that spoke to any any time you go to any government building, there's a line and you don't know how long it's going to be, and someone shows up and they can go right to the front. So you know, really specific, small detail, but it just makes for an incredibly interesting book, covering a lot of uh, facets to it, and ultimately allows you to grow and go with your imagination. I guess that leaves it to, to everyone on this call and everyone that, that, that's joined is, you know, to hand it over to you is, and to show us how to write a Middle Eastern sci-fi epic. That is it from my side. Sorry, it got a little bit rushed at the end. Um, I realized the time and I think wanted to give, I, I can see there's a lot of good discussion. Um, after all, I guess, Tarami? Yes, this was, this was really amazing. Uh, and don't worry about rushing it. I'm, there's so, so many conversations are happening in the background at this point that I think we'll, <laughs> we'll just pick right back up where we started. I, I do want to go back all the way up to some of the first questions, though. Somebody asked a question about the first illustration that was kind of like a faux Persian illustration that also had the Star Wars uh, is, yeah. thing. So this, yeah, do you know who did that? This, this is a Turkish artist, Morsi. Uh, or Moti, I'm not, maybe I'm not saying his name right. Um, but if you Google it, you'll find that he has a lot of really, really good ones. What he's done is basically taken kind of science fiction and thrown it into older style um, art. So he has a really nice one, which is, um, uh, I'm forgetting the one with Matthew McConaughey, that movie, where they land. Interstellar. Interstellar. Uh, yeah, right, he right. has it in the style of the Japanese waves, that really famous uh -huh. one. Cool. So he has a really, really cool picture. The, one of the next kind of big uh, questions that was also a kind of a conversation was about uh, Dude, which you haven't really spoken about. Jim, do you want to hop in and ask your question about that? Uh, sure. I wanted to ask if you've uh, read Dune or maybe watched any of the movies in that franchise, TV shows. Uh, it's one of those uh, science fiction epics that takes a lot of inspiration from uh, Arab and Muslim elements to the point that uh, uh, the other name of the main character Dune is uh, Muaddib. Yes. Uh, I actually never uh, read it or saw it, but I did play the video game uh, on CD at the time. Um, so I actually wasn't aware. Um, I, you know, I, and I can see here as well, Zayd is stuck at home, also mentioned about Star Wars. I think it's, it's very clear that there would naturally be a lot of elements um, that we'll see in Western science fiction that might have come from the Middle East. And I think part of that is one of the things that science fiction can explore is completely other societies. And, you know, within this world, if you were to tell someone about, uh, you know, um, certain cultures uh, in, uh, let's say, Africa or South America, to someone, that culture or the way that they live might sound like science fiction, you know? Um, one of the most recent, uh, uh, you know, things that we saw is uh, uh, a show that maybe everyone's seen called Unorthodox, which is just a true neighborhood in Williamsburg. But to us, it seems almost unreal. Again, almost like it's science fiction. I mean, it, it's something straight out of a Margaret Atwood book, um, for example. Yeah. But I'll definitely, I'll definitely, thank you very much for that recommendation, Jim. I'll definitely look to read June. There was um, there was one question about um, Phoenicians and whether or not they ever featured in a sci-fi epic. I don't know if I'm misquoting that question, but uh, did anybody want to ask that? So yeah, I, I see. I see it from Rida Isa. Uh, um, yeah, right, Rida. Uh, Rida, uh, are you still on? Do you want to ask that question? You can unmute yourself by pressing the yeah. spin bar. Hey, dude. Yeah, I'm a bit shy to like uh, ask that question, to be honest. But like, um, I'm writing a sci-fi. No I'm trying to write a sci-fi novel called The Chronicles of Luciferius, and I'm basing it basically on the the Phoenicians and stuff, and like you know, like comparing it to the Lebanese dias diaspora that's occurring. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. Hear you. All right, dude. Yeah, um, so I'm trying to compare, yeah, to the Lebanese diaspora, like in South America, 
in Africa. Like I lived in Ghana. I grew up there and stuff uh, for 16 years. Then I, I left the country. Um, and so ba basically, yeah. Um, and yeah, like I went on trip with MUN and stuff. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, um, I, you know, unfortunately on, in, my, in my research, I didn't come across it. Um, but to be honest, it wasn't one that I, I necessarily could considered or thought about um, but it could be definitely something to see I mean I mean obviously as you might uh, as I'm sure you're aware the Phoenicians uh, one of the what's considered some of the modern day alphabet comes from there so I'm sure they've written um, stories so what those stories were unfortunately wasn't something that I touched on but uh, I wouldn't be surprised you know especially as the Phoenicians were seafarers so that might have naturally tended to more um, uh, you know, interesting storytelling. Uh, if we think about the Odyssey, uh, which is, again, more about going out to sea and all the different things that they face while at sea, and the sea is this kind of unknown world, if you will. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't. It, that would be definitely something really interesting. And once you finish that book, please uh, let us know. <laughs> thanks. Th thanks, for the, thanks for sharing that, that question. Um, there were there was a series of conversations about recommendations of um, uh, sci-fi novels by non-Western writers, and uh, you guys can go to some of the recommendations that were written in the comments, mm -hmm. islamicsci-fi.com and arablit.org slash, and you can find the science fiction category there. There was also, uh, Lauren also recommended uh, Sichin Lu's Three Body Problem, which is very well known, as well as Nedi Ok Okorafor. Um, uh, just just to I, know on this, I mean, obviously, I um, I focused a little bit on West. I touched on obviously the Hindu um, and uh, then the Middle Eastern. I'm sure every culture, every society has science fiction. Um, it's it's such a broad, beautiful topic. Um, so you know, please don't uh, take it that these were ignored. Uh, it was just the Western was more because it's one that I imagine a lot more people might have known about and, and uh, were aware of, and then just trying to relate it to some of the more Middle Eastern ones. Uh, Mazen, would you mind, as you take a couple more questions, would you mind going to your slide with your references? Um, yeah. And then as you do that, um, I, just to make a plug for the website, uh, for those of you who don't know, if you go to afikra.com slash talks, you can search for Mazen's presentation. Um, and kind of look through the slides there um, and the references should be out there as well. So um, some of the questions in the comments that are a little more broad about, you know, history about other things that are a little adjacent, um, definitely check out the, uh, our, uh, our archive because there's a lot of really good stuff on there. So this list of references, for example, if you go look at Mazin slides, you can sort of click through a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah. Um, One of the, the, go ahead. Yeah. No, sir. Uh, I'd say if there are other questions as well, you can, as Rami said earlier, type them in or raise your hand and Rami will keep on sort of moderating through them. Sorry, go ahead, Rami. Yeah, there was, there was one question about um, sort of the understanding of aliens in like Abbasid, uh, uh, in the Abbasid Caliphate, like whether or not this conception of extraterrestrial life actually existed at the time or if you had come across that. Uh, before yeah. you answer that, I, I will plug very hard and say that th th these kinds of questions are you know, perfect starting points for future Africa topics. Yeah. So please, if you're actually interested in the topic, that would be amazing, an amazing sp place to start. You know, take us back to that uh, kind of space of the eighth century and try to understand how did they perceive the solar system or whatever. Mazen? Uh yeah, so actually, I mean, uh, good timing, I guess. Um, because here in this image, so here's just some of the um, references. But here you can see, I mean, there was astrology. Uh, I think even Asad said it, sorry. Um, astronomy, not astrology. Well, both, actually. Um, but there was the study of astronomy. So it is something that was uh, probably considered. Again, this here, this picture um, is uh, one that was taken from the Awaj bin Afaq book. So it's kind of a bit of that image of the universe. But, you know, even, even within um, a lot of different uh, religious cult, uh, discussions, I guess, there was always this 
um, you know, in a way, if we want to answer the question of people being alone in the universe, is uh, humans and jinn, for example, I mean, that's another, uh, obviously, a completely different topic, not one that necessarily I know enough to go into. But there, I don't think there was ever a thought that we were alone. <laughs> Great. Um, there was one more question about sources, but I think you've, you've kind of covered that a little bit. So if it's okay, I'm going to skip that and go to some of Angie Hamui's comments, uh, who said uh, if anybody was interested in starting a science fiction group to get in touch with her. Angie, do you want to say a word? Okay, we'll, we'll, we can go back to that. Um, yeah, she, she wrote that she had uh, she wrote about a Muslim Middle East sci-fi on Instagram. Yeah. So that's awesome. I'll definitely check it out. Um, okay, so follow Angie on Instagram uh, for that. Um, uh, Maisa uh, Sorry, I want to make sure I have... Oh, so Yusra um, in DC wrote, uh, you know, a question about whether or not um, Elif could be considered an Arab novel or an Arab sci-fi considering that it was written by like a non-Arab mm. woman, or, you know, albeit a Muslim woman, as uh, Angie pointed out later on. So do you, have any, do you have any thoughts about that? Because I think that's an interesting question. And Yusra, feel free, feel free to jump in here. Yeah. Uh, you know what? It, it's definitely one that I'm sure a lot of people might point to. Um, but I, I, again, I, for me, I, I've always thought with um, science fiction is that anyone can write anything about any topic. Um, so, you know, the, the point of view was Middle Eastern, um, which I guess was a bit more of the, the important part. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I can definitely see, you know, of all the things that a white American woman might want to write about is to write about the Middle East and, you know, science fiction. But I, I think, uh, you know, with, with a lot of really, really good science fiction, it could be interesting to go into the source or who the author is. But um, I mean, if we think of uh, J.R.R.R. Tolkien, I mean, uh, an old English man, but Lord of the Rings and, and all of that, or, or George R. R. Martin, for example, um, you know, it, they, they are who they are, but the subject matter is probably, again, this is my, my view, the subject matter is a bit more the interesting part. Yeah, I but think that's definitely, definitely a, a good, good, uh, good note. Yeah, I think like with all art, it's, uh, it's interesting to sort of think about if the subject or the, the author um, sort of qualifies it as being able to hold that adjective, right? Like Arab art, is it the subject or is it the location or the author, um, the artist in, the, in that case? Uh, so it's definitely, I remember when you were working on the research, it's something that we talked about a lot, like how do we really sort of create these dotted lines and say, what is Arab or Middle Eastern art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, Rami, I, I really like the question from Ahmed Damin. Um, yeah, sorry, so I haven't gone to the more, but yes, go ahead, pick it up. In addition to the more common distinctive features like metafiction in the Thousand One Nights, what are the main distinctive elements of Middle Eastern sci-fi throughout history that makes it distinctive and different? Um, you know, a lot of it was probably the really distinctive features is the, the setting. You know, a lot of the settings were Middle Eastern, um, which is interesting because that's probably, again, if we go back to June and the pictures of June that I've seen. It's, it's like a desert, acrid world um, with the big worm, uh, you know, Star Wars as well. You know, Tatooine is just, it's Tatooine is the name of a Tunisian city um, or town. So, you know, I, I, I think uh, the setting was always one of the parts that, that played a role and it just spoke to the area of where it came from. And, you know, even if it was a faraway place or, uh, they were going on these uh, big adventures to to foreign worlds. It's still the setting was kind of that what we'd imagine it to be Middle Eastern and, and walls with minarets and, and these type of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Saoud, you had a question about Phoenicians. Um, maybe send me a note on Instagram, and I can recommend a couple of good books. I can tell you it's very hard to find good sources 
because they never spoke about themselves and we don't even know what they called themselves actually. Uh, so, but send me a, a note on Instagram, Rami underscore AK, and I can, I can let you know my, some of the sources that I liked. Uh, Lubna had a question. Uh, oh, sorry, before that. Maisa, if anybody's interested, there's an awesome Syrian artist called Ayham Jabir who makes sci-fi-esque Arab art. Look into it. Uh, Lubna, uh, not a question, but if any, sorry, Lubna, do you agree with a certain analysis of Mary Shelley's book, um, whether or not the neo-Miltonic one or the metafiction reading? Lubna, do you want to say something about that? I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the question is. Lubna, you can unmute yourself with the space bar and just hop in. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, well, I'm still a university student and I'm studying Frankenstein and I'm a little bit confused about the analysis of Frankenstein. So I'm reading different analysis of it and one of them was the Miltonic one uh, about Frankenstein being the same as um, the um, monster and the other one um, is the psychoanalytic reading which is um, the monster and Mary Shelley are the same character. So I don't know, I was confused. So I just want to ask, do you agree with a certain critical analysis about Frankenstein or do you have your own analysis about it? And if I want to write an adaptation of Frankenstein, is there a certain critical analysis to write about, which is more common worldwide? Uh, very good question. <laughs> Um, one thing I will say is that there's actually a really, um, it's one that I, I, um, I hadn't included, but you should check out, I think it's called Frankenstein in Baghdad, uh, yeah. if I'm remembering correctly. But yeah. um, that probably is, is a really interesting approach to that one. I, I had included Frankenstein because it did have some elements. I mean, in terms of your question, unfortunately, I, I, it's difficult for me to answer just because I haven't read the, the book fully and I don't know any of the critical analysis. Um, I, the only thing that attracted to me was the fact that there were some circles that did consider it to be science fiction. So, you know, I, whether it could be read in one way or another, or, or again, I'm not sure, but I thought the fact that it was looked at as um, a teenage book that spoke to what it meant to be a teenage girl um, uh, was, was the thing that attracted me. And, Again, the fact that it was science fiction, but unfortunately, I can't or have no real answer to it. Thank you, thank you. It's fine. But about Frankenstein in Baghdad, do you see it as a sci-fi more than a political book? Uh, you know, I think every really good science fiction has, will be political. Um, you yeah. can't escape that. Uh, the really, really good science fiction, every one that you'll consider um, has some political element to it. Uh, and here we're talking books. Uh, we're not talking uh, movies. Because obviously Star Wars is just uh, again I'm not sure how people other people see it but um, maybe the prequel. Thank okay. you, uh, guys. We're gonna try to wrap it up in ten minutes, so I'm gonna try to just pick maybe three or some questions and 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 then we'll try to wrap it up. I think people are worried about losing the conversation. The the call is being recorded, which. I think automatically saves the content. And so if there was something that you saw that, that you missed that you didn't save, um, you know, let us know. Maybe we can, maybe we can. Return. And um, in the chat, there's a, those three little dots. That's a menu. I think you can save the chat as well. Right. Yes. So that's true. If you need to save the chat, I, if there's something in the chat, you definitely need save it yourself because that's probably the best way to do it for you. Right. That's probably better. Um, okay. So, ba -ba -ba -ba. There was one actually I just want to touch on because I think Lena had asked it um, a, a few times about the sources. So I did use a mix of English and Arabic. Um, I didn't just rely on English. I was searching in Arabic. Um, so it, it's, it is obviously incredibly important to, to have Arabic. I mean, it, it, it's difficult to say, to talk about modern Middle Eastern um, science fiction without Arabic sources. The English sources unfortunately were more about the older um, Middle Eastern science fiction, um, partly because it's not always that easy to find Arabic um, sources on old Middle Eastern things, uh, sadly. And I think that's just because um, we tend to see probably a lot more specialization from people in the West on these very specific uh, topics. Um, and I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't want talking about academia in the Middle East, but um, that's, that's a whole other topic. 
But I just wanted to answer that one because she had asked it um, previously. But definitely Arabic and English sources is important. Mm -hmm. uh, as I uh, made a note about um, Ali al uh Twitter feed that has threads on all sorts of Islamic mythology and jinn and other uh, kind of creatures like that. Mira asked, uh, her question is, why is the Middle East no longer famous for its production of science fiction? Good question. I, I guess maybe the question goes back to if, if the Middle East was famous for its production uh, of science fiction. Um, and I, I, I like to think there was. Uh, again, in terms of the influence, it was probably wide. Um, and I, one of the things I think for really good science fiction is an ability to, to say and write what it is you want. And I think just probably in the past 20, 30 years in the Middle East, that, that wasn't always the easiest thing to do. Um, funnily enough, a lot of really, really good uh, books and, and um, science fiction, if you will, happens when you can't talk about things because you need to use uh, metaphors, you need to use similes, and you can say the society is that. But I think um, in Middle Eastern society, in the Middle Eastern society, that's probably still not that easy. Um, I mean, I would say it, it's it's probably a lack of imagination from our part. Um, but there are still a really, really a lot of really good books out there. Um, I don't want to take that away, of course. But, you know, to have really good science fiction, you need to have a, a good imagination. And I think we're probably so caught up in our, in our own issues that we don't have time to, or that almost privilege, if you will, to think about something different. It, can I, in defense of, uh, can I tag something onto that? Yeah, I, don't know yeah, that I don't know that any culture is like, quote, unquote, famous for science fiction. It's like, it is in, uh, not in by definition, but it's largely a niche genre right so it's not like when we think of science fiction we're like oh my god the chileans are killing it like <laughs> they are the science fiction people or like oh my god you gotta you gotta go down to you know uh zambia they do science fiction well um by definition it's it's a or largely it's a niche it's a niche genre um and what I loved about your presentation, at least for me, somebody who's not like long on science fiction, um, is that you like uncovered, <laughs> for me, a lot of, uh, a lot of literature and uh, you know, content that I didn't really even realize. I didn't even like really uh, categorize them as science fiction. I didn't even know they exist. So for me, I actually like think that you helped outline how much you know, great science fiction is really coming out of the region or is about oh, the region definitely. one way or the other. So I kind there's, of, there's, I like the way you, uh, you responded to that. Cause I do think there's a lot of stuff coming out of the region. I, I don't think anyone's going to become famous for it. That's what I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I mean, Mustafa Mahmoud and, and Yusuf Azad uh, Isa used to have like a, like a radio show, no? Where they yeah. like spoke, exactly. where they let, like their novels were also read like on the radio. In, in Egypt, which like radio was just like the most mainstream media. Yeah. Um, okay, lastly, the, the last, the, oh, just, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick one, sorry, I don't mean to go through those, but um, here, this one, I mean, uh, if you go to the talk, this is actually a recording of, oh, the, cool. of the play, which is The Journey to Tomorrow, the one of uh, Tawfiq Hakim. So it's the full, I mean, it's like an hour and a half, I think, so it's a full play with the voices, with sound effects. It's really, really good. And exactly as Rami's saying, I mean, these were things that were put on, um, these were put on radio. So it, it, it would be as if you put it on Netflix uh, this time, right? So there was a mainstreamness to it. Um, I think uh, Rami, for better, just because I'm worried about people dropping off. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm gonna. Uh... Yeah, we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, Raith had a couple of, of points that he wanted to make about uh, Al Jazari, and I know that he just wrote another comment also about Egypt in the 70s, 60s and 70s. We won't have time to kind of keep going just to respect everybody's time. But this was really an amazing uh, conversation today, and I hope some yeah. of it can continue offline. I also hope that it inspired some of you to do your own 
Afikra Talks and somebody asked how to do that, you really yeah. just go www.afikra.com slash apply. And that's a great way to sort of start the process. First of all, uh, just a huge round of applause for Mazin. Uh, like really, 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 really great work. Um, and uh, thanks a ton. Thanks so much for the questions and a huge thanks to Mazin. Thank you.